Venite qua, benvenuti in cucina. Welcome to my kitchen. Today we are going to make deliciously simple roasted turkey breast. A delectable turkey gravy. Roasted potatoes with sage and garlic. Green beans with almonds and mint. And we're going to finish with cranberry sauce. And I'm going to tell you my favorite story and how is that I discovered turkey while traveling with my family through l'autostrada del sole, the sun highway. Come for the recipes. Stay for the stories. The story that I want to tell you is that on the way up uh, to see my grandma, and it would take us a couple of days to drive because we would be all the way into Sicily, still to this very day, there is not a bridge that connects Sicily to Italy, so we had to take the boat, wait for a turn, and then we would drive, and it would take us two days to go over there, also because my father loved to move around, but there was one particular portion of the road that I loved, l'autostrada del sole. <laughs> The recipe I want to share with you today is my perfect rendition of roasted turkey breast. Turkey breast by itself is very difficult to cook for the fact that it is usually so dry, has no fat in it whatsoever. So let me show you how to make a perfect injection that not only brings in flavor, but at the same time is going to bring a level of taste, the likes of which you've never seen before. Plus, it will keep your turkey absolutely moist. Let me show you how to make it. I have the oven already preheated at 350 degrees. It's important that the oven is preheated before you put the turkey in there. Let's talk about the challenges before us. Turkey breast has the least amount of fat, so by nature, it's going to be dry. Uh, it doesn't matter if you cook the whole bird. It doesn't matter if you just cook the uh, uh, turkey breast, as I'm doing right now. Being dry is one of the challenges that you're going to deal with. So for that, I have a solution. This right here is uh, chicken stock. And what I'm going to use is a syringe that I typically use when I do my barbecue to inject the stock inside the turkey. Why? And that's a question you always want to ask yourself. The turkey as it is right now is only gonna have the flavoring from the outside. In a moment, I'll show you exactly what I'm going to do. This is to maintain the juiciness on the inside. So here we are. You see the hole right here? This is the guide that you want to have. So what we do is I try to put it at least an inch away. So the turkey now is loaded with this injection, with this skin, in spite of the fact that it's very thin, stretched on top of it, has underneath a layer of fat. If you put it on a pan just like this in the oven, one of the problems you're gonna run into is that as soon as the fat leaks and it goes down to the metal, you're going to have flare-ups. And that's where a lot of people have issues when they start getting smoke inside their oven. So I have a solution for that that you will enjoy. Let me move this aside for a moment. To this, we're going to add salt, but not just any salt. This is what's also known as ice cream salt. This particular type of salt, rock light, is used for the making of ice cream. Now, in this particular case, the reason why I'm using the salt is because I will place the turkey right on top of it. What is the advantage of this? The salt will act as a barrier. So as the turkey releases its juices, as the turkey releases its fat into it, instead of going down to the very bottom of the metal itself, it will get mingled with the salt and lessen any kind of flare-ups that you might run into. But before we put them in, we need to do a little bit of flavor. So. What I have in here is onion powder, garlic powder, paprika, salt, and pepper. And don't worry about the coloring that comes at the bottom inside on top of the salt. That's just fine. So that's all that we have to worry about, and it looks fantastic. Now, I'm gonna wipe my hands. The oven is ready, and let's get started. Here we go. Let's place this in the oven. That's how the commercials were on TV. The Italian government had just finished a brand new freeway, and it was called the Road to the Sun, because from Florence went to Rome, and from Rome went to Florence, and further down, it would make it all the way down to Sicily. Only that part had not been built yet, but the part between Rome and Florence had been. And once my father got on that thing, I was able to run its car very, very fast and get on to the Veneto region quite quickly.
For those of you that think that a gravy comes from a packet with powder in it that you mix with water, you definitely need to watch the next segment. Let me show you how to make the perfect gravy to serve with your turkey, even as a Sicilian wine in it, marsala. Let me show you how to make it. Part of the flavor that makes this very interesting is the following. These are turkey neck bones, and they're important because they're going to give the flavor to everything else that will follow. And I like to put them at the very beginning of it so they start to bring out the flavor of their own. As these uh, are getting warm a little bit at the time, we're gonna move ahead with all the other ingredients. The first thing we're gonna add is the mirepoix. What is the mirepoix? Mirepoix is equal parts of onion, celery, and carrots. Do you need to cut them so pretty as I do? No, uh, what, what's the matter with me? I just got some new knives and I'm going crazy. I'm having a fantastic time. Now, a bit of trickery that you don't get to see all that often is the following. It's using tomato paste as an ingredient. You can use tomato sauce if you want, but tomato paste is even better. And I like to put it early into the process. And the reason why I like to do that is because the tomato paste now is going to basically hug both the bones and the mirepoix. Now I'm gonna add another ingredient. It's a surprise ingredient. This is a little bit of chopped bacon. Why chopped bacon? Why putting bacon <laughs> with the turkey? At this point, I'm not so much thinking about the turkey itself. I'm thinking about the relativity that the bacon will bring in terms of flavor expansion to this. As you can see now, the tomato paste is starting to melt into and it's starting to color everything. And this is the coloring that I like. Now, two more things that are part of my Sicilian thing. We gotta go with a little bit of garlic. And here we go with the garlic. Thinly sliced is part of it. Uh, you don't need to be as heavy as I do, but being Sicilian, I have a specific love for this. And an unexpected bit is the sage. I think that the sage and the turkey, with all the other aspects of what we have, really yields it. There's no reason to move fast. You just want to be gentle and make sure that nothing sticks at the bottom. Mom, I mean, I wish you were here. You can smell this. <laughs> this is the best part. Now, you all know how fanatic I am about my own flavor. This is the Nixtelino rub, which I love. A couple of shakes, that's onion powder, garlic powder, paprika, salt, pepper, and it just brings an elemental addition of flavors that enhances the very base that we created so far. This is something that is not typical of the American experience in the making of a gravy. You can use sherry if you want to, but because I am Sicilian, I prefer to use marsala. And here we go, a little bit of marsala. Now, as the marsala cooks down, and I'm gonna stir this gently all the way around, the marsala is gonna pick up all the flavors that are there. Let's give it a moment or two for the marsala to reduce. The next thing I'm going to add to create the beginning of a thickening is a little bit of flour, not a whole lot, and sprinkle it over it, just about this much. I would say give or take for this amount is roughly a tablespoon. And you can see already the stuff at the bottom is starting to thicken. You don't want to put too much because this is not the moment in which we want our gravy to thicken. Rather, what we want at this point is an extraction of flavors. This is the process that we're doing. And at this point, where you see everything thickening up like this, this is when we go with the addition of our stock. And here is our chicken stock. For those of you who are lucky enough to have turkey stock that you made ahead of time, it will work even better. At this point, all that you want to do is bring this to a boil. The mixture for a sauce is now boiling, wildly so. It is at this point that I like to turn it down to a simmer and move it back to the back of the stove where we'll make all the other dishes that will go along with our turkey. this brand new highway had in the middle of it, halfway between Rome and Florence, a restaurant that was built over 
the freeway, over the highway, fairly high, and you could have access both from the north side and from the south side. Inside the restaurant, there was all sorts of different food that you could have, pizza, sandwiches, but that's not what I loved. There was a formal restaurant on the inside that served all these beautiful dishes. One of these dishes was turkey. <music> There are two flavors that are super famous in Sicily, almonds and mint. I put them together to show you to make the perfect green beans. Oh, mamma mia, che sapore, che delizia, che bellezza. Let me show you how to make it. The olo is almost nice and hot. I'm using a non-stick pan because I want to have a sure success. You can use any pan you want, but what I find is that the non-stick for this type of jobs are unique. Uh, the other thing is to be aware and conscious of the temperature that's in the pan. You can see it from the oil curdling about as it is and swirling, but one of the things usually is I put a tester. And I take a look at this tester and when this baby starts to bubble up, then you know it's ready. I think we're ready. The importance of ingredients is extremely uh, indicative of the care that you have for yourself, for your friends, for your family, and the kind of taste that you want. The fresher, the better. Now I'm stirring this about, I'm taking advantage of the fact that the pan is completely non-stick. And this is one of the reasons why I like to do it. And as you can see, you're already starting to see some of the quick marks that are coming from the olive oil that is crisping the outside of the beans. The beans, per se, are already somewhat cooked. Uh, in spite of the fact that we only cooked them for three to four minutes, uh, they're already almost uh, al dente. But this is not where I want to go as of yet. Uh, at this point, the one thing that I love is a little bit of the Stellino rub. The Stellino rub is my signature, is what I love. It is not a secret. Equal parts of salt, pepper, onion powder, garlic powder, and paprika. Sometimes I even put a little bit of brown sugar, but not in this case because I'm working on very high heat. Look already, you can start to see the coloring. Why am I doing this? I'm doing it because it's fun. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but if you don't have fun in your kitchen, you're betraying yourself. To me, the kitchen is like a church. I come in here to think, uh, to wonder, uh, to find in my own head the solutions for all the questions asked by myself about life. And somehow they come to me. Already you can see this bit of flavoring that has stuck so closely to the beans. And look how pretty they are. Mamma mia, che bellezza che sono. All right, here we go with the next thing. What I'd like to add at this point is a little bit of the mint. The mint and the beans, the meant to go together. It's a very Sicilian way of doing things. As this is taking place at this point, I'd like to add a little bit of the garlic just to add a little bit of flavor to let the garlic brown a little bit. You don't need a whole lot. We're not using it as a huge component. We're using it primarily for flavor. I'd like to point to something that's very key. You see sparse pieces of garlic, but what you don't realize is the garlic is leaving an enormous impression. It's an aroma, it's a scent, uh, it's a presence. Uh, something that if we were to omit it, it would still taste fantastic, but this garlic picks up with the garlic powder with which we sprayed uh, the beans before we brought them to such a high heat, and now we have exactly what we're looking for. This lick of flames that I was telling you right here, this darker marks right here, is what I refer to as flavor. Now, it looks like we're done, but we're not. There's one more ingredient that's key. Sliver almonds. I like to add them just like this. At this point, what you want to do is to toss them a little bit. And we are on medium heat right now. The beans are now done. All we have to do is to check on the turkey and see if it's done.
and I remember how special it was for me to be holding my plate in line, waiting to be served before I would go back to the table and sit with my family. And while everybody chose pasta and fish and roasted meat, I would always go to the turkey station. I don't know if it's the same thing for you when you cook at home, but whatever you got going, especially for Thanksgiving, the oven is always loaded with all sorts of dishes. The one that I made and the one that my friends and family brought over. So I came up with a unique recipe on how to do roasted potatoes on the stove and fried roasted potatoes. These are unique. They will accompany your turkey and they're full of flavor, but they also have a unique taste that comes from the sage and the garlic. Very simple to make. Let me show you how to make it. All right, all that I'm doing right now, I'm moistening the potatoes that we have parboiled already with a little bit of oil. Why? Because I want for this flavoring to stick to it. This is the Nixtelino rub. You know it already. I told it to you so many times. The reason why I do this is because I want for the rub to stick right on top of it so that when we cook it into the pan, it's going to have this wonderful crust of flavor. I mean, you could put it directly into the pan, but this one gives you the exact insurance that everything gets done right. And uh, here we are, we're getting ready for this. It's nice and hot, so voila. One of the biggest mistakes that people make all the time is that once they add the potatoes, they start moving them around and tossing them and turning and twisting them. I'm of the opinion that you just wanna let them be because what you want to do at this point is for the potatoes to create a crust. If you wanna imitate the finish that you would get in the oven, this is one of the ways of doing it. So for a couple of minutes, just let them be. Right around now is when I like to add the garlic. And immediately you will smell the aroma. Now, one thing that I do when I'm alone in the kitchen and my wife is not around to see, I put a little bit of the red pepper flakes. She's not around, so it's safe. At this point, put a little bit of the chopped sage and we'll finish it on high heat until they get the nice, perfect brown. Potatoes are done. Now all that we need to do is strain the turkey gravy and turn it into a gravy. Let me show you how. Two simple steps we need to do. The first thing, we need to strain it. And we're going to continue the reduction of the sauce even after we strain it. Now, we're going to put this in the back of the stove again. We're gonna Put it back to a simmer, and we're going to reduce that by half. But while we're reducing this, let me show you how to make the cranberry sauce. The turkey was a weird thing. We didn't cook it at home. My mom didn't like making it. I only had it once a year when we went to this restaurant. And uh, for 16 years, every year, we would stop there. So in my life, I had uh, turkey 32 times before I came to America. Once on the way over, <laughs> and once on the way back. First time I had cranberry sauce, I didn't get it. So tart, I asked myself, who eats this? So over the years, I came up with my own combination. This is my version for the cranberry sauce. It has orange juice, it has orange zest in it, lots and lots of sugar. But the thing that I love is the perfect combination that it does have with the flavor of the turkey. Let me show you how to make it. First thing, we go with cranberries, and you can either find them fresh or frozen. Either way, the recipe remains the same. This is one 
single orange that I have uh, basically turned into juice. We're gonna add this juice as well. To this, we're going to add the zest that came with that orange. And then, for those of you that believe in the power of sugar, especially when we're fighting tartness, here we go with the sugar. Now, at this point, you really want to do is mix everything together. We're pretty much exactly where we want to be. Pretty soon, over this medium-high heat, these uh, uh, cranberries will start to break. And as they start to break, they will inject into the liquid the uh, essence of the sauce. The sauce is nothing more than the juices from the cranberries that are folding into the sauce, the orange juice itself, the zest, and the sugar. That's all. Once they reach a boil, there is one more ingredient. What I love to do at this point is to add orange liqueur. Now that this has reached a boil, what you want to do is bring it down to medium, medium high and let it cook for 15 minutes. The cranberries are gonna need a little while longer to come together to the perfect sauce consistency that we want, so we're gonna let them be. But the one thing that I want to do now is finish up the gravy. There's one last step that we need to do, and that is degreasing uh, the gravy. So let me show you how to do it. I wanna move it into a degreasing cup. There is a beaker that comes up this way, but this beaker does not pick up the fluid until it's down here. Between here and here, you can see the division between what it is the gravy and what is the fat. By using these two, we'll be able to get away almost 80% of the fat that's left in the gravy. As we look in here, one of the things that we see in is the gravy is still a little bit on the loose side for being considered a sauce. So we are going to thicken this and we're gonna use a slurry, a cornstarch slurry. What is a slurry? The cornstarch is mixed in equal parts with either chicken stock, uh, turkey stock if you have it, or even water. Uh, and then you mix it together. You mix it together like this to make a slurry. Now, be careful on the amount that you put in because I would say about a tablespoon will thicken up quite solidly, uh, almost four cups of liquid. So one of the things that you want to do is twofold. Add it a little bit at a time, that's why I'm using a beaker like this that gives me control. And two, have a whisk with you so that you keep on whisking as this takes place and you can maintain a certain degree of control. So we go with a little bit. It's already there. Um, taking off the heat. The gravy is ready. Checking now. The cranberry sauce is ready. I don't know if you've been keeping count, but the turkey is ready to go. The potatoes are ready to go. The green beans are ready to go. Our gravy is ready to go. And our cranberry sauce is ready to go. Let me show you how to play this delicious meal. What I love about this dish is not only is very festive and fantastic for the holiday and all, but what I love about it that's great is it's an everyday menu that you can do for your family. Just because occasionally we serve this at Thanksgiving with very big holiday plans and all, why not make it every day for your children, for your family, for your friends? Plating it is an issue of formality. Whichever way you like it, it's always the best way. My wife always has all sorts of ideas on how to do it just right. She loves this combination, where she likes to have it a little bit on the side, just like this. And the last touch is the cranberry sauce. And this, ladies and gentlemen, 
This is my favorite turkey plate. This, to some, is just a dish. To me, this is a time machine. A time machine that reminds us all of our youth, the moment that we spend with our family and who we are, as people, as friends, and as a family. And this is how you make roasted turkey with cranberry sauce, roasted potatoes, green beans with mint and almonds, and gravy. Spice with just a little bit of marsala, Sicilian style. But the thing that I love is to see the turkey breast perfectly cut across, folding over into the knife, being served onto the plate and then poured with this beautiful gravy, which I think had a little bit of marsala in it, but it's another story. And then the mashed potatoes. I will bring that to the table and say, Mama, when we get back home to Grandma, we got to make turkey. And my mom will look at me. I don't like it. It's dry. I don't like this bird. And that was my story until I came to America has a long period of time, almost as if reverse osmosis canceled this whole thing. Where I'm going with this, I have no idea, but it sounded good in my head when I first thought of it. It sounded genius-like. Yeah, and what are we doing after that? Um, we can do nothing. We can all leave. Oh, I wouldn't mind. Sure. <laughs> 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 <laughs>